Um, so if any of you who are in the back have weaker eyes, you might want to move up front just a little bit, because this is going to be a bit of an eye chart. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Tim Mackey. My current role within Citrix is a, a Zen Server Community Manager. I'm part of the Citrix Open Source Business Office. Um, I am also the Zen Server Evangelist, been that for a few years. Uh, occasional coder. I used to say that I code in, only in anger these days, but um, maybe a little bit more coding lately. Uh, some of the cool things that I've done, you can see up there. Uh, so I'm not just like grunting out little small bits of code, but um, uh, I've got a couple of interesting things up there as well. On Twitter, I'm at Zen Server Army, um, and all the decks that I present, including this one, will be up on my slide share. And give me a second while I flip some batteries into the clicker. There we go. Uh, and we get things moving. Um, so with the whole Zen server piece behind me, you are well within your expectations of saying that, well, the best hypervisor is going to be Zen server. And the reality is the best hypervisor is the one that's going to give you what you need at the end of the day. And so what are we trying to accomplish? And within 30 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit quicker. So the big thing about clouds is that everybody wants a cloud today. And your boss is going to say, gee whiz, but I need one. And then lo and behold, you have to actually build one. So in order to start out with something that you're actually going to be successful with, you first have to define what it is that you want to accomplish. So what are the types of services that you're going to offer? Um, who has access to them? Who's actually owning them? Who's going to be maintaining them? Um, what do the templates look like and things of that nature? Defining all the expectations around tenancy requirements, uh, data isolation, key management, um, who owns what from a compliance perspective, those are all factors that go into uh, the definition of success within cloud. And all of those pieces, well, they're not actually technology selection. Those are the things that actually matter to your org, your customer's org, and so forth in terms of being able to decide what success is. And so, one of the things that's really cool about CloudStack is that it's multi-hypervisor. You can mix and match pretty much anything that you want. The cloud that I run internally within Citrix is called the Showcase Cloud. It's got some vSphere, it's got some KVM, it's got a whole bunch of Zen server in there, and it's all mixed and matched, and I can go and provision whatever I need to, and all of the pieces talk to each other as happy as happy gets. Some of the decisions that come into that are also, do I want to pool things? Do I want to have a cloud which is made up of a whole bunch of independent hypervisors, or do I want to use VMware's clustering or Zen Server's clustering to accomplish what I need to accomplish? And then it comes into storage definitions and so forth. So when I look at how I'm building these things, and this is where all the eye charts are going to start, and you can see where I've got some of them right now. What we see, and this is all current as of 4.3, what we see is we've got a couple of different choices in play. Um, and we've got some things that we want to be able to do. Now, if you take the Zen server, for example, stock Zen server today comes with the open virtual switch as its default network stack. If you want to use security groups with Zen server, you actually have to go down to bridge mode, which is contrary to most things that Citrix will recommend. So a lot of these little gutchas are more tribal knowledge at this point. And so that's kind of the point behind this presentation, is give you the eye charts, see what things work, what things work with a certain asterisk beside it, and what you want to accomplish. So for example, if you want to do IPv6, if that is a true requirement for you, yes, Zen Server can do IPv6 on the guest side, but not on the host side. If that's important to you, you don't have IPv6. You would have to go to KVM, for example. Looking at a VLAN segmentation or the uh, advanced networking model, you get some of the same kinds of restrictions. And I love how when you shrink things down, little R's appear. Um, but the maximum number of VLANs that you can support varies by your hypervisor. Again, IPv6 is a KVM only thing. If you want to be able to support a net scaler in your environment to do uh, load balancing or auto scaling of the, uh, the network services, you're not going to be able to do that if you choose LXC. Similarly, you get uh, interesting things like, uh, nope, that's the next slide. Uh, you'll, you'll get some pieces that are specifically supported by the vendor in a cloud stack environment only on a specific hypervisor, even if it's going to work on all hypervisors. And so that's the support statement that they have in place. And so that's actually uh, Contrail. 
So it works perfectly fine on other hypervisors. They've just chosen for now to support it only on Zen server. So natively, we can do GRE tunnels on top of uh, Zen server because that in a Zen server environment is our cross host private networks. Even though it leverages the open virtual switch, which can be put into KVM, that concept and that topology doesn't exist there. And again, here's where we flip things around. If you have a desire to do N-tiered applications and security groups and your Zen server, you actually can't do both because one needs bridge and the other one needs the virtual switch to function. And so a lot of these kinds of gutches are in play. So if I'm delivering specific network services, and I want IPv6, well, that's KVM. Security groups will also work there, an incredibly large, well, let's say the whole 4094 range uh, for VLANs, you get that with KVM. If you want VXLAN and your vSphere, well, obviously you're going to need to get something like Enterprise Plus in play, um, and probably also the Nexus 1000V, which is going to impact your overall success from a, uh, a costing perspective. And, some of these things actually do play out in terms of the overall success of the cloud by looking at what the cost of service delivery is. So that's the network piece. And when I do designs, that's actually one of the areas where I spend the majority of my time because there's so many areas where it can just get confused quickly. But instances need a home. And so the first piece of this is primary storage. So primary storage is fundamentally that storage which is hooked up to the hypervisor where your VMs are actually running and live and are happy and can do whatever they need to do. This is where Hyper-V, which is newly introduced within 4.3, starts to look very different than every other hypervisor that we've got. So there is no NFS capability. There is no iSCSI capability. Now that doesn't mean that you can't do these things within Hyper-V, it just means that the Hyper-V plugin doesn't have this capability. Further, in order to support uh, primary storage, they've chosen to go with SMB3, which means that if you're doing multi-hypervisor with Hyper-V, you have to contend with the fact that SMB3 is only on Hyper-V and none of the other hypervisors that you might want to have in your environment. If you want multi-path iSCSI, so traditional enterprise multi-pathing, you're going to be using Zen Server, and CloudStack doesn't have the capability of defining all those paths, so you have to define it within Zen Server's uh, storage repository wizard or on the command line, and then set it up as a pre-setup storage repository for, uh, for Zen Server. Direct array access, if you want to do some VAI stuff, that's vSphere uh, through and through. Your template format obviously will map to whatever the capabilities of your hypervisor. We have some uh, plugins as well, so the SolidFire plugin, the NetApp plugin, they're perfectly there, just not on Hyper-V. Uh, if you want to do some zone-wide storage, uh, you get that with vSphere and KVM, but not Zen Server. So a lot of these things kind of play out in terms of what your overall storage architecture is going to, to look like. And again, if you want to do some RBD stuff, uh, well, that's KVM today. On the secondary storage side, so that's where all the templates live and snapshots and so forth, NFS is there across the board, unless you're Hyper-V, in which case you are back to SMB. Um, if you want to use Swift, you can, but you need an NFS staging area. Um, if you want to use an S3 compatible storage uh, mechanism, you can do that, providing you don't already also have an NFS secondary storage in place, because the two of them today aren't compatible with each other. So that's the network, that's the storage. And those are the two hardest pieces, unless you want to take a look at the actual features themselves and kind of map a few of these things through. So, for example, I'm just kind of cherry pick a few of these. And this actually does play into how you manage an environment. So when people start to do their first cloud, one of the things that they're tempted to do is manage things the way that they've always managed it, do it from vCenter, do it from Zen Center, um, use the same consoles but you can end up in a situation where some of those activities conflict with each other. And so, for example, if I go and take a look at high availability, Zen Server has a nice high availability uh, engine that does resource planning and pre-planning um, for around failure modes, but you can't use that with CloudStack because the two of them have entirely different algorithms for what the correct answer is and they'll conflict with each other. 
But if you're using vSphere, it will natively use the HA capabilities that are inside of vCenter to perform the work, which means that if you're a VMware admin, you can very nicely go to vCenter, you can see all the HA definitions, you can see activities that are happening, and other than the fact that there's these weird instance IDs and weird UUIDs that show up, it all looks completely natural and normal to you. And if you make changes, those will also flow through that CloudStack is able to understand what they are. And so when someone's looking at it from a multi-hypervisor perspective, how they're managing these things really becomes a case of who is the master of the environment. And so as best as possible, if you can keep CloudStack itself in charge, you're going to have a more successful multi-hypervisor solution. And so that even gets down into things like snapshots, IO throttling, uh, being able to dedicate resources, all of these really cool capabilities that exist within CloudStack are now starting to become hinged upon what hypervisors that you have and how those things have played out. Now, one of the more interesting things from just a code contribution perspective is that some of these features have been developed around a specific need, and they work perfectly well within that specific need. But if you wanted to extend that functionality, that's an opportunity to contribute as well and say that, you know what, just because I don't have, for example, memory snapshotting in Hyper-V doesn't mean that it shouldn't work. And if I've got a Hyper-V environment, why not make it work? Or just because I've got a memory overcommit limit uh, capability within Zen server, I also want to have it in KVM, why can't I make that work? So that's the core functionality, but if you take a look at the capabilities of the individual hypervisors, things get very interesting. So if I take a look at maximum VM density, and anyone who's, how many people here have used Zen server before? How many people remember that Zen Server has a fairly low VM limit on it? <laughs> Guy in the back's grinning nicely on that one. Uh, we've actually bumped it up in 6.2 quite nicely. Um, some of the stuff that Russ was talking about, we also took and brought into Zen Server. So it's not uncommon to be able to get hundreds of VMs per host. Uh, it used to be a case of you could buy hardware that you couldn't fully utilize. Now you can buy, we'll use everything that you can buy. Um, so. CloudStack's VM density has been bumped up to 500 in 4.3, and 4.2, and before it was 128. We use direct Zappy calls, so there's nothing special that you have to install on a Zen server host in order to make it work. Uh, Zen server has a max cluster size of 16. I usually make some comment at this point about uh, choosing the correct cluster size, because if your cloud is successful, whatever that number is, is irrelevant, because you're probably going to grow beyond it. So use something that is modular for you. Um, so if it's four, if it's one, if it's six, if it's 10, whatever it is, but make certain that you've got some modularity behind it. On the operating system side of things, one of the things that we've decided it makes easy to explain, easy to understand, we support any Windows operating system that Microsoft is gonna support because we're not gonna be in the business of fixing Windows. So if something breaks, we don't wanna have kind of a finger pointing thing, which means that XP's technically dropped off the list as of last week. Same thing with Linux operating systems. We've got all the, uh, the RELs, the uh, SLES and so forth, um, some Ubuntu and, uh, in there as well. On the Zen server advanced features, we support our virtual switch, storage Zen motion, which is the ability to migrate a VM um, and it's storage to a different LUN or uh, even across pools, as well as the dynamic memory control to do the memory overcommit. Those are the three, quote, premium features uh, that are supported within Zen Server uh, within CloudStack. With vSphere 5.5, um, the primary mode of integration is with vCenter, so if you just wanted to use the vSphere hypervisor, that's not a supported entity. Um, we are making direct vCenter calls. Um, the VM density is, again, comparable to what we have within Zen Server, so you can do some pretty uh, highly, dense, highly dense environments. Advanced features, this is where the beauty of integrating directly with vCenter comes in. We get the HA, we get DRS, we get the uh, virtual distributed switch, we get vMotion, we get the Nexus uh, 1000V, we get the ASA 1000V kind of out of the box. Um, broadest support for operating systems out there, and so this really comes down to don't try and fit something into the model if you don't have to. If you have an operating system that's only supported on VMware, well, let's go and deploy it on VMware. If it's an application that's only supported on VMware, go and deploy it on top of VMware. Don't, don't try and mess with the weird support statements just to try and make it all fit in. Let CloudStack be that abstraction layer so that the users don't know and don't care 
it all just kind of works. So KVM, and this is specifically looking at Cent 6.5 as well as um, the LTS version of Ubuntu 12. Um, the maximum VM density is whatever your P cores are, multiplied by 10. CloudStack will only, uh, by default, let you run up to 50 per host. Um, you can change that in the config variables. It does have a, uh, its integration is through libvirt, but there is a CloudStack agent, which means that on every KVM host, you have to have a CloudStack agent installed, which also means that you have to be sensitive to things like upgrade uh, outages and so forth. Um, there are none of the advanced features that, for example, you might get with uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization are supported within this because it's libvirt, not overt, that we're integrating with. Um, and the operating systems are pretty broad as well. On the container side of things, is this theoretical limit of um, 6,000? Actually, out of curiosity, who's worked with containers so far? Cool, that's actually a little bit higher than I expected. Um, I might wanna talk to a couple of you guys afterwards because I got an interesting little side project on containers and hypervisors. Um, this also does do the integration through libvirt, but it, doesn't have the capability of doing the system VM, so the console proxy, uh, as well as the secondary storage VM. So you need to have a pure KVM environment in there someplace to run those uh, system VMs. Otherwise, it's simply not going to work. Hyper-V, newest operating system with 4.3. Um, we will support the maximum VM density that Microsoft does, which is 1024. There is a CloudStack agent which is installed on the Hyper-V host that is all written in C-sharp and WMI. There is no system center integration, so any config manager, VMM, um, ops manager, none of those components are integrated at this point in time. They may be in time, uh, but this is the 1.0 of this particular uh, support. Uh, max cluster size is 64, uh, but we'd probably recommend going a little bit below that just to have more modularity. So in terms of the best one, well, the real answer is there is no best one. The best one is gonna be that which gets the job done for you uh, in the most economical fashion. And so a lot of the best practices that are out there may not necessarily yield the best one. Um, there was a customer that I was working with a couple months ago who had their best practice was to have some direct attached storage on every single host, and they had a specific vendor in mind. And that ended up yielding a cost per VM per month of $1,000 which was well outside of what they had as their range um, for what was acceptable. So they're in the midst of doing a re-architecture um, so that they can get things a little bit more under control. Um, so just because you've always done something a certain way doesn't mean that you have to. And particularly when you start to get an abstraction layer like CloudStack above this, nobody really needs to know what's running under the covers so long as it's running within the SLA. So the primary value proposition for KVM really is its low cost, very familiar administration model, and it is broadly developed, it's got a very rich feature set uh, that has active development underneath it. So obvious uses are dev test clouds, web hosting, um, tenant density, which is gonna dictate some SDN use cases. Um, one of the biggest weaknesses, of course, being that it does require that libvirt agent, so it's another management uh, thing that you have to take care of when you go and perform upgrades and so forth. Uh, very limited native storage options, and because of the integration with libvirt as opposed to overt, there's no advanced capabilities thrown in. On the container side of things, I was first introduced in CloudStack 4.2 by a specific um, uh, vendor. Um, it does require KVM for the system VMs, as I mentioned. Um, as well as that libvirt agent. Really, really well designed for hosting environments um, where you might have smaller applications in a dev test environment as well. Hyper-V, the primary value prop here is the unlimited Windows Server licenses that you get. Um, so if there is a requirement to have Windows Server in, the, uh, in your cloud, uh, Positioning with uh, Windows Server 2012 R2 Data Center Edition gives you that capability. Um, for those people who are uh, familiar with Microsoft's management paradigm, this is dead easy to manage. Um, perfect for .NET hosting, uh, Windows <laughs> workloads, as well as desktop as a service type clouds. Uh, no real use of advanced features or functions. Um, again, no integration with System Center as well. 
On the vSphere side of things, uh, broadest application, broadest operating system support. Um, very easy to find people who know how to administer a vSphere environment. Um, incredibly large ecosystem, so long as VMware doesn't upset somebody this time um, and change some APIs around. Um, but fundamentally, you've got a, a vast pool of stuff to, uh, to pick from. Um, many of the cloud stack features are actually native implementations, which is really good. Um, private enterprise clouds, this is where we see the majority of the vSphere deployments being, mostly because, well, that's where the majority of the vSphere deployments are. Uh, dev test clouds. The biggest weakness is on the costing side of things, and what we have been seeing is a fair amount of interest in, hey, if I go cloud stack, do I still need to have the vSphere environment in place? Because now I can go and have that forcing function that says I can go and look at what the actual cost of service delivery is. Um, keep the vSphere for the really difficult things and let the utility stuff, which is where most clouds are today, uh, take advantage of all of the, um, the, the, the more web-centric workloads. Um, vCenter integration does require some redundant designs. So if anyone who's run v, uh, VMware knows that if vCenter goes down, then you can't manage the environment. So you do need to have the whole heartbeating mechanism in place as well, and then have CloudStack talk to the heartbeat server as opposed to directly to the vCenter server itself. One other gotcha in here is that while you can have multiple clusters per zone, you can only have one v, uh, vCenter data center node per zone. Um, and that's a change that happened within 4.2. 4.1, you did have a little bit of flexibility around that, but with 4.2, that's, uh, that's a new change. On the Zen server side of things, um, again, it's a low-cost option. Um, I'm not certain what the current stats are, but I've heard numbers as high as 85 to 90% of cloud stack based clouds have some amount of Zen server in them. Um, very, very active development. Um, it is direct integration through the Zappy tool stack, which is what Russ was talking about, uh, as one of the available tool stack options. Um, I just did um, a code commit to separate out the concept of Zen from the concept of Zen server uh, within cloud stack. Today, they're a little bit commingled. Uh, the idea being that down the road in the not so distant future, we could have a pure native Zen project hypervisor in there for those situations where you want to have a different tooling uh, to accomplish whatever tasks you need to, ta uh, to attack. Uh, cloud use cases, desktop as a service uh, within Citrix is kind of a sweet spot for Citrix, so uh, we know that this is going to work through the stack. Um, very large VM density. Uh, I typically position Zen Server versus KVM as they're both going to do pretty much what you would want from a virtualization perspective the primary difference is going to be on the security side of things because Zen Server is more of a type one hypervisor versus KVM being more of a type two hypervisor. The security boundaries are a lot more rigid in a Zen Server environment. And so that means that tenant isolation is a little bit better. Um, the net result being that you can mix and match them. They all work perfectly fine together. So for those situations where you need that additional security, flip some Zen Server in when you don't need it. You could keep some Zen server, or you can go to KVM and accomplish exactly the same task. Sweet. So multi-hypervisor support. Um, I mentioned that I have the showcase cloud, and I've got all of this wonderful capacity. I'm running three hypervisors in there. The biggest thing that I had to contend with was ensuring that the network labels and labeling uh, was compatible across all of them. Um, Zen server calls things a certain way. Uh, KVM calls things similar but not quite the same, and VMware's way out in left field. You can make them all work together quite nicely. Um, it's just a matter of sitting down and saying, well, what is the thing called that is physically attached to this set of trunk ports so that I can go and accomplish what I need to do? The ability to actually successfully network these together really is the intersect of the core uh, capabilities of those hypervisors. So again, if you wanted IPv6, well, you're not going to get it all the way across because KVM is the only one that has it. Um, on the storage side of things, that first bullet point is Tim's success story as opposed to a true requirement anymore. Um, in 4.0, there was uh, a series of bugs where if you had multi-hypervisor, the, 
the last hypervisor to be added, a system VM could get stuck there, and if there was insufficient capacity and needed to restart, it wouldn't automatically restart on other clusters that were uh, with plenty of capacity. So what I do is I actually pin that. And you can do that within the global config parameters and say what the actual uh, preferred hypervisor is for, uh, for a specific system VM. Um, zones with primary storage, uh, zone-wide primary storage is, uh, is limited. It's a new feature for 4.2, so uh, little bits there. Uh, same thing with uh, vSphere data center spanning zones. Um, Hyper-V today, um, they say that it can be, but practically it can't be mixed with other hypervisors because of things like storage um, as well as the network labeling. Um, you'd be impressed with the number of people who ask the question, can I use HA to migrate between, say, vSphere and Zen server? And the answer is, what, huh? No, can't be done. Um, capacity planning, it's a lot more difficult when you have multiple hypervisors in place but it can be done, it just requires a lot more attention to detail. And so, if we tie it all together, um, the most important thing is to find what it is that you're going to have as your success criteria. Uh, we hear a lot about fail fast and fail often. Um, your boss doesn't want to hear that. Your boss wants something to be successful. So I go back to what did virtualization look like 10 years ago? You started with the easy things. You, did, you went with file and print servers and web servers. Uh, you may have thrown in uh, some LDAP servers or domain controllers. You didn't start with SAP. You didn't start with Oracle Financials. You didn't start with a massive SharePoint farm or something of that nature. Be successful, show that this cloud thing can work, show that this cloud thing can deliver value. Find some topology that actually makes sense. Are you going to be a service provider and go crazy? Design for that at the outset. Are you uh, a private enterprise and you've only got, say, a dozen business units to contend with? Design around that assumption. There's, there's no reason to build something more complex than you need to. Same thing is true with storage. From that, decide what you want to support. Don't let everyone and their uncle come in and say, hey, I'm going to have this template, I'm going to do these things, and I'm going to have all this random stuff because at some point something's going to go wrong and you're not necessarily going to be able to pull back and say, oh, I ran out of disk space because this guy defined a template that needed 10 terabytes of storage and I don't have 10 terabytes of storage to give him anywhere. Why? What? You don't want to be in that business. Once you have all of that, you've now got yourself a set of requirements that will dictate the types of hypervisors that are going to meet your requirement. Far too often I see the, hey, we're a VMware shop, let's go put VMware in there because VMware is kind of cool and now you're kind of trying to fit what you want to accomplish into a VMware model as opposed to saying, hey, I've got this opportunity, let's go build the things that I need to build to be successful and find the technology that makes the most amount of sense. Then validate that matrix and build your cloud. It's that simple. And I think I've got one minute left. Questions? Ah, oh, nobody gets a t-shirt. I'm gonna lob a few of these things out. Let's see. We have one for... <laughs> I have no idea what the sizes of these are. Whoops. Let's see. The last time I did uh, one of these presentations, uh, I had a whole bunch of old CloudStack t-shirts uh, of random sizes, and was, who asked the questions? They got t-shirts. So that's it for me. I thank you very much. I hope this was good for you. Great. Thanks, Tim.